Okay, everybody, we're ready to get started now. Well, good morning, and welcome to another edition of the Russian Military Forum. For those of you who have not previously attended such an event, I thought I would start off by introducing the series. The Russian Military Forum is a reasonable, recently new initiative of the Russia and Eurasia program here at, U at CSIS. Uh, under its guise, we expect to hold a series of events over the next year on key issues regarding Russia's military and its defense and uh, security policy. Among the topics we anticipate covering will be a deep look at Russia's military strategy, the progress of its military modernization programs, and probably a look at some of the individual service branches and how they're progressing. So welcome to all of you, and I hope you'll be able to attend some of these events going forward. Of course, the focus of to uh, today's event is on Russia's hybrid warfare campaign in Ukraine. And before I introduce today's speaker, I thought I would start off by saying a few words about the topic just to provide a little context. First, the advent of Russia's hybrid warfare methodology in Ukraine has clearly emerged as one of the key issues arising out of the conflict. And it has deservedly received widespread attention in the, in the media and in the policy community in general. Russia's actions in Ukraine, especially its hybrid warfare methods, have clearly challenged the West in new and unprecedented ways. And that is because Russia's military involvement in Ukraine has been anything but conventional. In Crimea, Russia launched a stealth campaign relying primarily on elite troops, often without insignia, the so-called little green men, to rapidly seize and gain control of Crimea, uh, the Crimean Peninsula in a relatively bloodless affair. And by contrast, in eastern Ukraine, Russia has, uh, has used on, uh, and at times bewildering a mix of both military and non-military measures to achieve its objectives, albeit with considerable bloodshed. For the most part, Russia has chosen to fight unconventionally, acting indirectly through armed rebels and so-called volunteers, which have been, been dispatched to the Donbass region. At other times, Rosa, Russia has chosen to act directly, inserting its own regular forces as and when it deemed necessary to tip the balance of the fighting in its favor. In addition, Russia has employed a number of non-military means to enhance and achieve its objectives in Ukraine. Using economic measures such as cutting off or threatening to cut off oil and gas to both Ukraine and Western Europe itself, denying Ukrainian industry access to Russian markets, deploying spyware and launching cyber attacks on Ukrainian government sites, using diplomatic delaying tactics such as engaging in endless ceasefire negotiations, and perhaps most importantly of all, conducting sophisticated information operations both to undermine the support of the Maidan regime and to bolster support for Russia's actions in both Ukraine and in Russia itself. Throughout, Russia's engaged in an active campaign of denial uh, designed to disguise the extent of its involvement in Ukraine. And thus far, these tactics have been quite effective. While the West has been struggling to formulate an effective response, the Ukrainian army is losing the war on the ground. All this raises a number of important questions, both for Ukraine and the West. How does Russia's hybrid campaign actually work? Just what are the specific methods that Russia has been using in Ukraine? What are the origins of Russia's hybrid warfare approach? How much does it represent deliberately formulated doctrine that have been planned in advance, or how much are the Russians just winging it as they go along? Are these methods transferable to other potential conflicts? For example, could we see these kinds of methods used in the Baltics? Why has the West struggled to mount an effective response to this new hybrid war campaign? And what should the West do to counter these measures going forward? To explore some of these topics further, we are extremely fortunate to have with us today Dr. Philip Carber. Dr. Carber is currently president of the Potomac Foundation, a defense and foreign policy think tank located here in the D.C. area. He is also an adjunct professor at Georgetown University's Department of Government, where he lectures on military and security affairs. He's a veteran military analyst with a distinguished career both inside and outside of government. Among the highlights, he previously served as a director, I'm sorry, as an advisor on strategy for former Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger. Most importantly for our purposes today, 
Dr. Carber has conducted 12 separate fact-finding missions to eastern Ukraine since the crisis erupted, holding discussions with a variety of both military and civilian uh, uh, participants in the campaign. And he is here with us today to share some of those insights that he has gained. So with that background in mind, I am pleased to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Philip Carver. And Phil, thanks again for joining us today, and I'll turn the floor over to you. It's great to uh, be back at uh, CSIS. Uh, I was a, uh, a doctoral fellow here in the late 60s uh, at CSIS, not in, in this building. At the time, uh, we were above a grocery store on 18th Street. Uh, <laughs> The only thing we in the grocery store had in common were the roaches. Uh, the, uh, and when we founded the Potomac Foundation in 1988, uh, the first event we did was uh, co-sponsored with um, uh, CSIS uh, under Dave Abshire. It was called uh, Defense Economics for the 90s. Um, I was thinking about this morning, I, where the hell did the peace dividend actually go? Uh, anyway, um, so it's very, very great to be, be here. And, uh, And uh, Paul raised, I think, the right questions. Uh, I don't claim I'm going to give you uh, answers to, uh, to half of them, let alone all of them. Uh, but I'd like to give you a, a, a perspective. Some of it will be uh, personal, uh, and some of it will be um, analytical. Uh, I got started a year ago uh, this month. Uh, because Potomac had uh, ran over 1,000 seminars, uh, for over a 20-year period in helping a number of the former uh, Warsaw Pact and uh, Soviet republics who were interested in uh, more Western orientation. Uh, when the new interim government came in, uh, they sent a letter and said, hey, we uh, had attended some of your uh, seminars before. Uh, would you come over and do an uh, assessment of our situation? Uh, I was interested in, in, in doing that, but I felt like it was important to do it uh, as a bipartisan effort. Uh, at the time, uh, at least uh, whatever independent assessment one came out with did, didn't end up being just uh, politicized. So I reached out to an, an old friend and colleague known for 30 years, uh, General Wesley Clark, a former NATO commander, former 2004 a Democratic presidential candidate. And the two of us uh, decided to, uh, to uh, do it as a bipartisan effort. Um, I called him on a Friday, and 72 hours later we were in Kiev. The, uh, over the last year, uh, we sort of had a division of labor, uh, sort of ironic. This, uh, the, the general ended up doing uh, most of the politics, and the civilian ended up doing most of the military stuff. Uh, but when we first got to Kiev, we, we realized that, that being in the capital was not the best place to get a, a good assessment of what was going on militarily. So uh, over the last year, of, uh, as Paul said, I've made uh, numerous trips to the to the front, um, and when I say front, I'm, I'm not talking about um, a VIP visits, but actually going out and, and being with uh, troops in the field. Um, been behind the lines uh, three times, uh, one unintentionally, uh, so we made a wrong turn in a, in a rainstorm. Um, been under fire a couple times, uh, so I, I can, when I talk about uh, Russian artillery, I can uh, uh, say it was some degree of uh, personal experience. Uh, one of the things that makes it easy is uh, the Minister of Defense and the Minister of uh, Interior uh, gave us basically a remit, uh, sort of a free pass to basically go anywhere, ask any questions, and it's been very helpful in terms of uh, being able to do a very honest uh, assessment. Uh, I asked uh, the uh, separatist side if they would give us a similar one, but they uh, so far haven't come through with it. Uh, I'm going to start off with uh, Garisimov's. Uh, some ex excerpts, he's chief staff of the uh, Russian general staff. He gave this speech uh, to, in a closed session with, with the general, at the General Staff Academy, and then excerpts of it were later published. But it's really probably the most succinct uh, uh, statement by any uh, senior Russian uh, military official of their kind of view of the future uh, direction of war. Uh, they don't claim it's their invention. In fact, most of the examples he uses when he uh, uh, wrote this piece were actually from other parts of, of the world, but they were generalizing or making some general uh, statements. And what they argue is essentially the, the old constructs, essentially that we've grown up with in, a, in the Groshian world of uh, states, uh, where people declare war, where you have uh, 
uh, formal uh, military uh, uniforms and responsibility. Uh, you have normal, traditional military hierarchical organizations. Uh, his argument is that a lot of that has essentially uh, uh, gone away. Uh, again, this isn't necessarily by Russian design, but by their uh, summing up or concluding uh, what they think are current trends. Uh, they also spend some time talking about new types of forces, mobile, smaller units that work on a dispersed battlefield. If you look at uh, Russian exercises uh, over the last uh, 10, 15 years, particularly the Zafad series, which they did in 1999, 2009, and again in the fall of 2013, and look at their critiques of those exercises, you can see them really struggling with their force design and uh, their issues. Uh, I think some of these are, are, are pretty interesting, not only in terms of the, the forces that's, uh, that's involved, but the idea that you're having operations throughout the depth of an opponent's area, uh, simultaneously with the initial combat, uh, that some of the major aspects of the, of the conflict are not military, the, the, the issue is already decided politically, uh, and, and the military forces are merely consummating uh, uh, other forms of uh, action. And the last paragraph is kind of interesting, where he talks about the, uh, the use of uh, robotic systems. Uh, and I'll uh, personally experience uh, experienced the uh, Russian use of them. And, um, and, and, and I must say, uh, it, it is start, uh, startling when you, um, when you experience it. Uh, my argument is that the, basically there's sort of four stages, four elements of hybrid warfare. To me, what makes hybrid unique is not that it's unconventional. We could just call it unconventional war. It is that you actually have uh, a political agiprop information war that can transcend or go into a major insurgency that can in turn uh, turn into a, a, a very serious high intensity conventional uh, conflict and even have uh, overlay of nuclear coercion and nuclear threats. What's interesting about it is not that they go stage by stage, but they can go up and down. So you can be in high intensity uh, conventional conflict and literally within two or three days you're in a ceasefire. And that ceasefire can last a while and all of a sudden it can break out again. Overlaid on top of that are uh, nuclear alerts, uh, aircraft uh, flying uh, strike missions around NATO, um, assassinations of, of uh, leaders. Uh, so it's, it, it's, a, it, it's that combination that to me makes it uh, unique in terms of hybrid. The other aspect is that the lower two sides of this spectrum, the Russians go out of their way to distance themselves uh, and, and basically pretend that they really it's, uh, have almost nothing to do with it. Uh, it's just sort of happening out here and they're kind of observing it, maybe supporting people, but very, very, very uh, uh, intense effort. Uh, and it, it, for example, in, um, in Crimea, you know, uh, for two or three months when the West was all trying to figure out who the hell these little green men were, uh, you'd have the, uh, the head of state, you'd have the head of the foreign ministry say, uh, we don't know who they are, they're not us. And then within a month or two of those just direct uh, denials, Putin's on a, on a telethon, and he goes, yep, those are my little green men. It was kind of cool. And he gave a more recent interview just the last uh, 48 hours where he sort of bragged about it. Um, and that's different. That's, that essentially is uh, a willingness to compromise the very concept of diplomatic integrity. Uh, so anyway, those are the four steps. And basically, I've organized uh, my uh, uh, comments uh, around that. And then uh, certainly have to op open up for questions or, or comments uh, as we go through. Uh, if you look, I I'm, I I'm treating the, the events in the Donbass rather than uh, Crimea. Uh, if you look at it uh, after Crimea had been seized, uh, there was a very intense uh, information warfare campaign uh, in, in, uh, in Russian media, but which almost everyone in the Donbass watches. There's at least five television stations. There are more television stations from Russia showing there than there are Ukrainian stations. And the majority of the people speak Russian, though the, 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 the 
idea of, the, of, of who speaks what in Ukraine is, is a little bit of a misnomer. I mean, if you walk around the Ministry of Defense, 75% of everybody's uh, talking in Russian, so it's not like this is just a, a small ethnic uh, uh, enclave. So, but there was this campaign uh, of uh, essentially protests. Uh, large groups of people, they would uh, sometimes bus uh, uh, people in from Rostov or Crimea to join the, the protest. Sometimes it got a little bit pushy or shovey, but basically it, was, it, it had all the markings of a legitimate protest movement along with a very uh, vociferous uh, information campaign. Then it started getting dark. Uh, politicians were abducted. A senior politician's child was taken and daughter and uh, taken to Moscow, and he had to negotiate uh, her release. Um, the guy that you see there on the, on the grass is pulled out of his car, um, thrown in the trunk, uh, and about two weeks later was found uh, after he'd been tortured horrifically, I might add, uh, along uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in a lake. Uh, in many of the towns in, in and around the Donbass, area, you'll have walls, and those walls uh, are heartbreaking. It's pictures, have you seen my father? Have you seen my brother? Have you seen my son? Um, my guess is that there's somewhere between one or 2,000 uh, missing people that have just disappeared. Uh, organizations such as Amnesty International have documented uh, abductions and so forth. Uh, I had a chance to, uh, in January, uh, six weeks ago, um, I had a chance to go uh, behind the lines and, uh, and interview uh, three uh, members of the executive committee of the, um, of the resistance in the Donbass. A Jewish professor uh, who described how now he has uh, uh, an observer in all of his classes, that uh, some of his students are, have been recruited to uh, report on his lectures and any student uh, comments. Uh, a uh, steel worker who uh, was a separatist, uh, wants the Donbass to be separate from Ukraine. Um, but after the uh, uh, Chechen mercenaries uh, abducted and raped his daughter, uh, he's no longer on that side. And a businessman who uh, uh, is forcibly uh, uh, required to do business, has to attend uh, meetings, uh, he has people in his office or in his, uh, his uh, plant uh, who are, uh, uh, stooges, basically people who report on everything that uh, goes on. There is a Stalinist repression settling in, 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 the, in the Donbass uh, that virtually goes unnoticed in the Western, uh, Western press. Uh, at the, as March went on uh, and you had this protest, the Russians did something else. They mobilized the uh, Russian army on the eastern Ukrainian border and uh, put about 80 uh, battalions worth of combat equipment uh, 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 from Chernigov all the way around down as far as Rostov. Uh, I think there's fairly good evidence that they were exploring or at least believe they had a quick run option to uh, seize Kiev and, and, uh, and essentially take over Ukraine, at least as far as the Dnieper. The Ukrainian army did something that has been virtually unreported. Now remember, this army had been neglected for 15 years in a host of different governments. It had been essentially reduced to a territorial army, and, and because they were on old Russian bases, 75% of that army was on the west side of the Dnieper. They did the largest mobilization and redeployment of any army in Central or Western Europe since the end of World War II virtually miraculous, it moved 11 brigades uh, from the west and got them up to the border. Uh, the Ukrainian general staff and intelligence department believes, I haven't seen the document myself, but believes that they have strong evidence that in the first week or so of April, the uh, general staff told Putin, we've lost the quick option. We can't just run and grab Kiev in 48 hours. Uh, we're going to have to fight our way through. Now, many Russians didn't believe. I've had Russian generals tell me last spring, oh, the Ukrainians will never fight. Or if they do, they won't fight more than a day or two and then kind of give in. Um, but nonetheless, it, it, so they, the, Putin faced, I think, uh, uh, based on that, uh, that, that information, Putin faced a, a, a choice. Does he 
uh, launch an attack or does he take plan B? And plan B in this case was essentially a uh, hybrid campaign in, in the Donbass. And all of a sudden, at roughly at the same week that ostensibly the general staff told him that the option was, uh, had been lost for a quick grab, uh, they start the seizure campaign. I was in Yepor Petrosk with a uh, group of Ukrainian military uh, uh, commanders uh, when they uh, took the first government building in Slovansk. And there was a discussion around the table, and the, and the uh, you know, uh, Ministry of Interior uh, commander said, uh, these guys are really well armed. Uh, I, I sent my policemen up there. They got much better arms than my policemen. We can't take that building back uh, with just police. So then there was a discussion. How long would it take to get an armored unit there and, and how much fighting would be? And then the Air Force guy said, well, why don't we just, I can just have a plane go and bomb it? And then somebody else said, well, why don't we get creative? We'll just take a truck bomb and we'll blow it up. And the, and the, and the argument was if you let the separatists or insurgents seize a government building and you don't take it back, then they're going to seize more and more and more and more. About that time of this discussion, the senior officer comes into the room having just talked to Kiev. And the interim government had had some furtive uh, phone calls from the Washington and from Western Europe and said, don't do anything. Don't be provocative. We'll talk to the Russians. We're going to handle it. But don't do anything provocative. So the Ukrainians didn't. And so it started off as one seizure, that's a yellow, uh, became more and more. There's a pattern to it in terms of taking over government buildings. Uh, police headquarters, communication facilities, and so forth. And it got more intense, so that, to the point where you basically had every town uh, center uh, was organized uh, now and controlled by, uh, by uh, agents uh, of the uh, separatist side. Uh, local policemen were assassinated or on a milder side, just told, we know where you live, we know where your kids are, um, just expect you to go along. Probably about a third of the police were pro-separatist. Uh, a number of the SBU in, internal ministry guys who had been in Kiev came from Donbass because Yanukovych was essentially the uh, a war, a ward, ward healer of the Donbass area. And so he had recruited a lot of his buddies to, to uh, the special services. And when he fled, and these guys found themselves, at one minute, you know, they're defending the government against protesters, and then the next minute, they're almost outlaws. So a lot of them went back home and served as a milit militant nucleus for some of the uh, military activities. So if you look at it, there were, in, in the uh, Donetsk and uh, Luhansk oblasts, there were about 8 million people. In the current area, because it's both smaller, uh, still contested, and because you had over a million people flee, it's down to about four million. But the, the amount of people who were actually involved in the seizure and the active activity was a fraction, a fraction of uh, the overall population. Um, if you go and talk to people, both in behind the lines or in cities that have since been uh, liberated back by the government, uh, the vast majority of people uh, had complaints about a centralized government in Kiev. Uh, for example, the local governors are appointed by Kiev. They're not elected by the local people. Um, it's kind of their rust belt. Uh, they, they were in high times during the Soviet period and, and sort of fallen on bad economic times in the region, has the highest alcoholism, highest uh, suicide rate of, in, in uh, Ukraine. So it's kind of a semi-depressed region. They have complaints. But the vast majority of people just want to live. They don't want to have a war in their backyard. They don't want to have their sons killed on one side or the other. They just want to go along and get along. But a relatively small group of people were able to essentially create a government. Here's two of the guys. They, these two fellows had been in Crimea. They were the number three and number four man who had pulled off the Crimean coup. And then they were brought in to organize the Donetsk thing. Here they are holding a press conference a week after uh, the, at, in, at the same table in front of the same map, uh, they had paraded uh, the OSCE observers who had been uh, uh, abducted and uh, tortured. Uh, uh, you hear stuff about uh, uh, right-wing guys in, 
in the uh, Ukrainian side, you don't typically hear about a lot of right-wing guys on the other side. Uh, the right-wing phenomena is going throughout Europe. And calling it right or left, I, I think it's more, it's a sort of a militant um, na nationalism uh, as opposed to particularly right or left. So here you have members of the Luhansk SWAT team and two brothers, uh, and they're both neo-Nazis. And they're proud of it, they go on Facebook. The, this young man over here on the right um, has sort of a bit of an, uh, a, a weird streak. He uh, posted on, uh, on his Facebook uh, beheading a puppy and uh, eating it. Um, so you, you get a, an element, an element uh, uh, of, of the sort of a, uh, a macho nationalist. Uh, it's interesting, uh, in the last elections in Ukraine, on the Ukrainian side, the, uh, the, the right uh, nationalist crowd got less than 5% of the vote. By that comparison, France is uh, a neo-Nazi haven because they got 15% or something out there. Uh, they've now created the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. And these are, the, 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 this isn't an accidental name, like in the similarities with a, a ruling structure, not necessarily communist, but a ruling structure that I, I describe as Stalinist, um, is, is very visible in both of those, uh, both of those areas. Uh, and they're fairly uh, uh, clear about their objectives. Uh, they view themselves as the cutting edge of Novo Russia. And Novo Russia is Russia's, uh, ought to be part of Russia. Uh, um, and, uh, uh, and, and they view it as their uh, stated objective. When they started the, uh, the new winter offensive on the 17th of January, um, the leader of the, uh, of the Donetsk uh, group um, was very clear uh, what his strategic objectives were. Uh, they want everything from Kharkiv all the way to Odessa. Uh, and initially, they brought in a number of uh, rough elements, and, uh, and they were so counterproductive in terms of their uh, rapine and pillage of the local population, the Russians then brought in uh, Chechen police, and uh, who, there's 40,000 of them who are, have signed a loyalty oath to Putin to help Russia police itself. And they came in and played hardball with their own guys. Um, so this guy had his uh, heart cut out, and you can actually see the video of people playing volleyball with his, uh, with his heart. Uh, I, I, I'm not trying to gross people out, but if you want to have a sense of what's happening there, some of these images are the reality, and, and we need to, to realize that. Uh, Putin has said that he doesn't care uh, if uh, uh, an area has a minority Russian population, he has the right to defend them, to intervene to, for them, and even incorporate that area that they're in, even if they're a minority, into Russia if that's what's necessary. Uh, so these give the percentages of ethnic, eth ethnic Russians. Uh, so Novo Russia, outside of Crimea, would, would still be only a, a quarter. It would, the Russians also, when they, uh, you can read in Voyani uh, Measle, uh, Russian, uh, uh, Journal of the General Staff, uh, Military Thought. Uh, they, they're very clear about some of the military objectives in, in this area. Kharkiv is the, uh, one of the major tank uh, and automotive plants in, uh, in Ukraine. Dnieper Petrosk, when I was at Dnieper Petrosk, uh, you walk through the uh, uh, Yushmash uh, missile factory and you can actually have uh, Russian ICBMs uh, laying there uh, being outfitted with Ukrainian uh, technology. Uh, also, Nikolaev is one of the great ports on the Black Sea. So there are military objectives, and they're very, they're very clear. It's not the only reason they're doing it, but certainly it's a factor, and, they, and they're very blunt about it. So in this process, there's a series of stages that they seem to be, be going through, and I'll just kind of walk through these. Uh, here you see, in March, the emphasis on protest. Then in April, seizures, and then uh, the violence, and the creating essentially a separate state um, in, uh, in May. 
Uh, along with it, on this map, by the way, you see a little white deal. Those are uh, infrastructure. Those are bridges being blown. Um, so a lot of infrastructure damage goes, goes with it. Uh, uh, in May, then, there begin, begins a flood of Russian military equipment. Uh, and the amounts of it are so extensive. Uh, of course, the, the, the narrative is, oh, they just captured these from the Ukrainians. And so uh, this isn't really Russian equipment. It's uh, uh, because uh, Ukraine inherited 99.9% uh, .9 of its military equipment from the old Soviet Union. Um, there are probably 85% of the equipment is, is still common. Uh, so the argument is, oh, well, that they just captured it. Um, but in fact, there were areas where they were crossing the border. Uh, the Ukrainians were, were trying to uh, uh, control those. It ends up being about a dozen different uh, crossing points. Uh, but here's puts the light of the argument. I mean, we have the log books of the equipment being checked out of, uh, of uh, Russian storage facilities and concerns uh, and being uh, signed out. Um, and also equipment that uh, the Ukrainians didn't have. Uh, of course, the, uh, the separatists are some of the greatest mechanical geniuses in the world. They have actually, in the space of about two months, were able to do what no other country had done in two years, and, uh, or less than two years, and build their own drones. Um, uh, these are, uh, this is the suppressor. Uh, that's only available on Russian uh, Spetsnaz uh, uh, units. This is their level five uh, body armor. Uh, I brought some back with me from the, on the last trip. Um, it appears that it stops not only the standard uh, 223 Western round, but also 7.62 round. Uh, it's also available only to the uh, airborne. Uh, there's TV programs actively recruiting uh, people uh, and a large flow of, of money coming in to pay them. Uh, by June, there were whole columns of Russian armor coming across the border uh, and photographed and uh, documented. Ask yourself, ha had, up till now, have you heard that on the 27th of June of last summer, Putin ordered full mobilization of the army? How many people knew that? The mobilization order is on the presidential web page. Uh, so you then have a sequence of events that end in tragedy, but start off. So this was the separatist area. Uh, Poroshenko, having been in power for a couple of months, tried to have a ceasefire, tried to negotiate. Nothing worked. So he then says, well, okay, I'm going to launch Plan B. And his Plan B was to take the Ukrainian army and concentrated in the Donbass, not just uh, uh, protecting the overall border. So he had four brigades sweep through the, the southern part along the border to try to est establish uh, border control. Uh, <clears throat> Michael Zabrowski, the commander of the 95th uh, Air Assault Brigade, uh, by the way, a graduate of uh, our Leavenworth, uh, pro everybody, either in Ukraine, the separatists, the Russians, all credit the 95th as uh, the best unit in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, they'd also, the 95th had also served with uh, U.S. forces in Iraq. Zabrowski uh, launches the largest uh, and longest armored raid in recorded history. He broke through the front, that's the dotted line, uh, separated the two sides, came down, and then went all on the you know, 450 kilometer uh, armor, full side uh, armored brigade uh, movement. That opened up the corridors then for them to, uh, to basically reduce these areas. Uh, about the same time, the Russians realized that if they didn't intervene, the uh, separatist uh, cause was going to be uh, collapsed. So starting in uh, mid-July, uh, they began cross-border fires uh, of uh, artillery. Uh, there are about 40 of those incidents uh, where they fired across. Uh, the Ukrainians uh, were told by Western leaders, do not fire back. That would be provocative. In fact, there was a decision made in the United States to not give Ukrainians uh, up-to-date, accurate intelligence uh, uh, imagery so that they couldn't uh, do counter cross-border counter-battery fire. So they just had to sit and take it. 
in one fire strike, uh, in, in less than three minutes, uh, two entire battalions were wiped out with uh, Russian thermobaric uh, warheads. Uh, this, this was not just an occasional shelling. This was extremely intense uh, combat. I think what's going on in, in Ukraine in its peak intensity uh, excels the uh, intensity, say, of the 1973 uh, Yom Kippur War, which was in, in its time uh, uh, a benchmark for intensity. Uh, as the uh, uh, Ukrainians were almost ready to, to sever the two different parts, uh, the Russians intervened. They hit their the Ukrainian brigade. This was on, they intervened on the 24th of August. Uh, while Ukraine was celebrating uh, its National uh, Independence Day and having a parade in Kiev. They never saw it coming. No one bothered to warn them from the West. Um, and the Russians swept in and literally rolled up four brigades, and they got caught in what was called the cauldron at Ilyabovsk. Uh, they held out for several days under intense artillery fire. Uh, then Putin offered them a humanitarian exit, but they had to leave their heavy equipment and, uh, they could, uh, and so they start down the road carrying their wounded, carrying Russian wounded, by the way. Uh, and the first lead element of the column got out, uh, but then they hit it with uh, uh, artillery fire. The Russians had promised they would, uh, if the Ukrainians surrendered to them, they would not turn them over to the separatists. They violated that one as well. The separatists went in. And by the way, the separatists do not take uh, uh, wounded. So if you're wounded, you're dead. Uh, if you're lucky, it's a bullet. If it's a Chechen who gets you and you're wounded, they slit your throat. So anyway, there's this big pocket. Uh, the front's wide open, and they broke out and basically drove until they ran out of supplies, because frankly, I don't think they expected that, uh, uh, that amount of success. That brought us then to, to uh, the ceasefire of uh, 5 September, otherwise known as Minsk 1. Uh, I'm going to come back to that, but I'd just like to stop and take a little bit, uh, Paul, sort of address some of your bigger questions about Russia. Uh, what's Russia been up to in terms of their restructuring of their forces, and, and, and how, do, how do we see that playing in, um, in Ukraine? So Russia used to have about 17 military uh, districts uh, in their uh, retrenchment mode. They've moved down to four, basically. And then in their internal arguments, they argue, well, in the West, we have sort of a high-tech thread. In the East, we've got a mass thread. And in the South, we have uh, sort of unconventional threat, so we need to have a force that can cover a wide spectrum of capability. They've been very blunt. So uh, they've taken a page right out of our uh, or NATO strategy in the 50s. We don't have an, enough. We can't afford an, uh, our old large conventional army, so we're going to depend on tactical nuclear weapons uh, for defense, and we're going to design our army so it can be fluid and use uh, low-yield tactical nuclear weapons uh, uh, in defense of our territory. Uh, so the those of us who grew up with the, the Soviet Army, 200 and some divisions, now there's only two, two divisions left, the uh, second mechanized and fourth armored, or fourth tank. Uh, but in the process, they've been creating these independent brigades. The intent was to have them be an all-volunteer force, or what they call a contract uh, force. Uh, for the specialists, uh, but, but it just didn't work because they didn't get enough volunteers. So they had enough people to fill out the airborne and spetsnaz and some of the more technical services like uh, tank and artillery crews. But basic, the basic infantry is still conscript. So that was sort of a, uh, a, a flaw in their logic, if you will. And they designed these new units to be operated on, on dis dispersed uh, 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 fields, and they created what they call a battalion tactical group. And essentially what they're doing is driving combined arms. Uh, everybody in the West has combined arms at brigade level, and we typically will cross-assign a tank company to infantry and vice versa. But what they've done is down at the battalion level is they're actually uh, permanently assigning artillery, air defense, and armor with uh, mechanized infantry. And they train as that unit, and so it's not an ad hoc combination, it's a fixed organization. And, uh, and, and, and they call that a battalion tactical group, and we're going to hear a lot more about it because that's what they've been using in, uh, in Ukraine. One of the problems they found first in, in Chechnya, uh, and then they sort of 
modified. It was conscript infantry don't work really well in their system. They're not motivated. They don't want to be there. Uh, they're not particularly well trained. They take a lot of casualties. And oh, by the way, they have lots of mothers. And mothers complain when their sons are squandered uh, in foreign battlefields, and they're pretty uh, vocal about it. So they go, uh, we got to have an alternative. So when they went into Georgia, they, they, they did a different action. The lead elements, you'd have a, a situation where you'd have a T-90 tank going down the road with a bunch of airborne guys on the top of it. And you go, that's weird. Why, why not the mechanized infantry and their BMPs with the tank? Well, because they didn't want the, they wanted the uh, contract guys who were better trained, but higher, more higher motivated, uh, to be in the lead element. And then the conscripts just sort of follow in and do security after things have been secured. That is a pattern we see uh, repeatedly now in, uh, in eastern Ukraine. So you'll see units that the sort of the technical structure of the unit is essentially Russian. It's Russian commanded. The signal officers is, is uh, Russian. Uh, most of the tank crews are Russian. Most of the artillery, at least the, 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 uh, the officers and the senior sergeants are Russian. Uh, but the infantry are, can come from a wide variety of sources. They can be extremely uh, well-trained uh, uh, people like uh, Spetsnaz or Airborne, or they can basically be uh, for higher mercenaries or locals. Um, they just released a whole bunch of guys from prison in, uh, in Donetsk, uh, and so some of these guys are, are uh, now serving as, as a sort of cannon fodder infantry. And, and also then separatists. So, and I'm not, I don't think the purpose is, to, is, is necessarily to disguise their role. The purpose is basically to have cannon fodder so you're not killing a bunch of Russian conscript kids. But it has the effect of adding a lot of confusion. So when Sakur says, oh, well, there's Russian units uh, that you're operating against, you're fighting against, and then the Ukrainian chief of staff says, well, no, we're, we're not fighting the Russians, we're fighting separatists. Both of them are right. Both of them are right. Um, because in the same unit, you have this sort of, sort of think of it as the m, &M version. You have the hard shell of Russian uh, assets and, and, and structure and inside the soft chocolate of the, uh, the cannon fodder. Another interesting phenomenon is that they have now introduced 48 of these battalion tactical groups either on the border of Ukraine or in Ukraine. Right now, I, my guess is there's about, it's about half and half, about 24 in the Donbass and about 24 along the, the border. And you look at it, and, and, and it's weird. Just, just like seeing airborne guys ride on tanks and the infantry being behind, um, this is weird. In, instead of taking and using brigade organizations, so you take a brigade with three or four battalions and you have him go to the, take a sector on the front. Instead, they're taking one battalion out of a brigade and sending it to the front. A almost never two battalions. So say, well, why would they do that? Well, it, you get, it gives you your best officers and, and, and best trained guys, I guess. Uh, it means you leave your conscripts at home. Uh, but it's a very strange way to run a military organization. Not only that, they're not just doing this in the, from the brigades that are local to Ukraine. They're bringing them from, from Sokolny, a cure house. Uh, they're bringing units from, from Murmansk. It, it's, the, it's the weirdest hodgepodge uh, assortment um, I've ever seen of any army. So, uh, so what you have is, it, is it, where, where normally you would think, oh, okay, I, 48 uh, battalion groups would be roughly the equivalent of 12 brigades. Instead of 12 brigades lined up, you got 48 individual uh, battalion tactical groups. And the Russians have talked about this in their literature over the last few years, how difficult it is to have a span of control. You know, no kidding. Um, but their argument the counter argument to that is that's the nature of this new type of war. You're going to be operate on very dispersed areas, and so you're in a, you, the idea of a hierarchical structure uh, where you have two or three, three or four units report up and, and organize it by threes or fours 
is, is wrong for this new environment. Uh, as they send forces to the front, they uh, uh, send uh, massive amounts of supplies. These uh, battalion tactical groups are not heavy in logistics. So they'll be in a fierce fight for four or five days, and they'll use up a lot of ammunition, phenomenal amount of ammunition. And then all of a sudden, they kind of go quiet, maybe with just some harassing uh, fire. And, uh, uh, and, and then they'll be quiet for four or five days till the next humanitarian convoy comes along. And then within about 48 hours after the convoys arrived, then all of a sudden, they're off firing several units of fire every day. It, it, it's literally cyclical like this, and you can, you can plot it to the, to the convoy. Uh, the rail traffic in uh, Russia, particularly running through uh, Rostov, um, but also up, up higher through Kursk, uh, is, is, is some of the heaviest uh, flow of military equipment seen since World War II by rail. What's interesting is the rail traffic now goes through Rostov and then comes directly into the Donbass and uh, 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 is offloaded uh, just a few kilometers outside of the city of Donetsk. One of the reasons that the, the big battle of Debalsevo Debalse was fought is it's a major rail hub and a highway hub as well. And the Ukrainians were trying to have that be a, a, uh, uh, an easy access route. Uh, this is one month, or basically five weeks, worth of equipment documented coming into the Donbass last fall. 890 major items of equipment. But, of course, the Ukrainians got nothing from the West. Uh, say, well, how do you know that it's really there? Well, it's there. You just take your, your handy Radio Shack drone and fly it over and you can spot the, the tracks in the snow. It's also sort of interesting, this by the way is a Ukrainian uh, uh, video from a Ukrainian uh, UAV. Um, but every one of these pictures, the vehicle is located next to civilian housing. Uh, when I was in the south and <clears throat> we wanted to try and find the T-90s that were reported, uh, that it had intervened uh, along, on, on, the, on, the, on the southern coast. Uh, they were there, and they were essentially in an apartment complex of uh, high rises, uh, but parked in between the, the buildings. So there's an intentional effort to try to hide the military equipment, or if not hide it, uh, sequester it among civilian targets, so then if it's, uh, it's it, you're hitting civilians. This is, a Ukraine, this is based on Ukrainian data. By the way, uh, there is a difference between Ukrainian data and various Western intelligence uh, agencies. Um, I have never found the Ukrainians lying to me or misleading me. Um, they're, very, they're very open about what their numbers are, how they get them. That doesn't mean they're always right. Uh, but uh, I, I, the, the idea that they sort of want to inflate everything just to uh, pander to... Uh, for Western help or something, I have an experience. Um, with the, the exception of their casualty numbers. Uh, and their casual reporting, I don't think it's necessarily intentional, but it's based on the casualties that were received the day of reporting. But pe casualties who then uh, died in the hospital uh, don't get added back to that total. Likewise, uh, missing in action don't get reported, uh, or prisoners of war. So uh, the, I think you could probably uh, realistically double the number of, of losses on the Ukrainian side in terms of, of, of people who aren't going to come back uh, 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 than the popular number. But you know, it's a large amount of equipment. And this is what's gone into the, now the proxies had virtually no equipment of their own. So you, if you want to know what was introduced to the Donbass, you look at the combination of those two. And then mu much of this has been uh, added along the border. Basically, at, uh, I was at uh, the uh, uh, Southern Command Headquarters in Yepper Petrosk with, uh, general, uh, with the commanding general, and, and he was showing me this slide. I've modified it a little bit, but taken some stuff off. But basically, it's his slide. Um, and this was 
about three days before the winter offensive started. But you could sense something was coming. And so each of these sort of uh, amoebas inside the Donbass represent about five battalion tactical groups. And then there's six battalion tactical groups in the four amoebas outside along the border. Uh, Ukrainians had their brigade stretched around. They only had a couple in reserve. And uh, what they were worried about was a breakout in six directions. Uh, in fact, when the winter offensive came, that's exactly where they, they went. Uh, the, you, the view of the Ukrainian front commanders was if, they, if the Russians succeeded in, or the, or the offensive succeeded in more than two of them, um, it could rupture the entire front. Uh, the first week of the winter offensive took Don Donetsk airport. Uh, then there was heavy fighting at Debaltseva, Debaltseva fell. So those two objectives have been achieved. Uh, they're clearly trying to make a major effort at Mariupol. We can talk about that. Uh, also, they're trying to break out uh, across the Seversky uh, River. Um, I don't think they're going to be successful there personally. But uh, this map is now misleading in that the Ukrainians uh, lost took some heavy losses at the airport and also at Dvaltseva. Uh, they have committed every single brigade on that map to the front now, except for the 14th, which was the old 51st Brigade that was wiped out at Ilyavosk and is being, re is being reformed, so it's not even an active a combat-worthy unit. There are no more reserves left. Everything has been thrown out front. Uh, many of the units are at half strength. Uh, there's 35 uh, uh, Ministry of Interior battalions uh, that counts border guards, uh, territorials, and volunteers. Uh, 25 of those are at the front, and many of them are, are probably most of them are now down at company strength. Uh, the Ukrainians are low on artillery ammunition. Uh, so it's going to be a, a, a much more fragile environment. The dotted line is where you would have the Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts if, as one entity. There is an argument, and it's an interesting one, that that, that is their inter intermediate objective because if they once they get to that area, then there is a the belief that they, they and the Russians have an agreement that the Russians will recognize that and uh, that entity as a state and have an alliance with it, uh, which will then authorize its a deployment of Russian, overt Russian military forces uh, to it. And, and the model, by the way, is uh, what, what happened in, uh, in Ostetia, uh, which was culminated just about a week ago. Uh, now, that does not necessarily mean it's the end of, the, of combat operations. If the front breaks open to the west, there's basically no terrain feature short of this line, notice the pole and stop road. This is, this is tank country. When the ground is dried in another six weeks, that's, that's wide open blitzkrieg country. And there is no discernible natural defense line there if you fall off the current defense line. Uh, so it's wide open. Uh, to the north uh, west, uh, there's a series of rivers, uh, but the one objective is ostensibly Kharkiv. So a breakout to the northwest could either swing around Dnieper Petrovsk or uh, head north. If the Russians decided to intervene, which they could, uh, the forces could, could outflank Kharkiv and link up with these guys. That would give them a land link to Crimea, basically take everything south of Poltava uh, uh, and east of the Dnieper, uh, and give them the option if they want to go all the way to Transnistria. So the the potential for dramatic change is there. I'm not predicting it, but it is there. Uh, I've been wrong just about every month except for twice. Uh, when General Clark and I were, uh, we spent three hours in, with a full session of the House Armed Services Committee on the 23rd of July, I made the mistake of predicting that the Russians would attack uh, in August, and they did. And, and then I made a similar prediction uh, just before Christmas, and they did. So I'm not predicting uh, what can happen, but 
that army is getting very, that front is getting extremely fragile, and there are not the natural terrain obstacles for fallback positions. And so as that army gets pushed off its current uh, defenses, uh, the front expands and the terrain opens up, which is uh, not a good sign. Talk a little briefly about the Winter War. Uh, this is, as of uh, 4 February when I was there, uh, this is where uh, Ukrainian intelligence had the East Little Arrows is one of those battalion tactical groups. These sort of pink uh, uh, amoebas are the locations of uh, battalion size uh, separatist units. So you can see that the battalion tactical groups were actually in the lead in virtually all of the fighting. They'd already taken uh, Donetsk Airport here, uh, and they were trying to cut off uh, uh, Dombalsovo. Uh, the what happened to Dombalsovo is described it very very quickly. Uh, the 25th just got bled out, so they put the 128th in, uh, brought the 80th around, brought the 30th around from here. So you had three full brigades into that pocket. Um, it got you know, some of the most intense combat Europe is, was in. I think it is the most intense combat Europe has seen. I don't think anything even in the, in the Balkans uh, uh, matched it. Um, the uh, 128th um, uh, did not get out of the pocket with any of its equipment. The guys that got out walked out. A brigade with over 100 uh, armored vehicles uh, came out with nothing. Uh, the 25th, which was normally have uh, BRDMs, uh, arm armored uh, vehicles, uh, has none left. Um, at the airport, uh, I was there and had a chance to uh, be with the kids. I was uh, at Pitsky, which was about a kilometer away from the airport, and that was sort of the staging area. And I had a chance to talk to the, the kids uh, who went in um, and ended up being the last. None of them got out. It, it, it is a very intense combat. This is the airport. This is what it used to look like, one of the most modern airports in Europe. And you can see each of them just massively uh, destroyed. Uh, when the che Chechens went in, they uh, slit the throats of all the wounded. Uh, they'd held it out for uh, 240 days. One of the things I want to raise is, I know this is a, a forum on Russia, but, but it's worth asking, why do the Ukrainians keep getting in this situation? That is, they put up a really good defense. They fight like hell, they, they, and, they, and they, they, they give three to four times as many casualties as they receive in a fixed battle. Then they end up getting in a pocket, and then they, either the pocket's destroyed, or they, if they get out, they, they lose all their equipment in the process. And I think it's explainable. So here's, this is me at the, at standing at this crossroads. That's an arrow view. So what you have here in this front is not a linear defense. It's a whole series of strong points. And the strong points are, can be four to five kilometers apart. Now, the problem is that Ukraine doesn't have any effective anti-tank guided missiles for their infantry. So if you're going to try and stop a tank, uh, you, you, and the reason is it, it, the, the stock that they have, first of all, we, pay, we paid them to get rid of a lot of their stocks in the 90s. Secondly, uh, and also a lot of their air defense uh, SA-7s, um, much to their regret now, and, and uh, a huge amount of ammunition. Uh, but they, the old anti-tank guided missiles they have, the Semtex is timed out, so only about one in three actually go off. So if you want to stop a tank attack, you basically dig in, and when, the, when you get hit and the tanks start to overrun you, uh, as they drive by, then you fire from behind because every tank in the Donbass has reactive armor. So these are uh, metal boxes with explosive. When the 
missile hits, the box explodes out and deforms the, the heat jet on the missile. It's very effective. Uh, that's me on the top. This tank had had three RPG hits and one AT-5 hit on it, and none of them had penetrated. This is a Russian, by the way, T-64B tank. This is the first one that an outsider confirmed, because I went, I got crawled in the tank, read the serial number, went back to Kiev, went through the records, and, and there were ne this tank was never in service with the Ukrainian army. It had always been a Russian, Russian tank. Uh, but basically, they don't have any way of stopping that armor. So what happens then, here's another position. This is, by the way, shot from a, a Russian drone. That's the drone there, the guy carrying it. Um, they, they dig in in a, in, a, in a position. They have some artillery. They have to penny pack at their, their tanks out because the infantry can't stop armor. So instead of having your own armor as a counterattack force or a mobile reserve, it's pitied like, like the French did in 1940. It, it's, it's, a, it's a stupid strategy, but you don't have any choice because you have to have something to stop armor uh, when the infantry don't. So what happens is uh, one, one or two of these things along this front uh, get overrun, and then you're outflanked, and next thing there's a pocket, and you're stuck in the pocket. And then all the artillery zeroes in on you, and uh, uh, the pocket closes, and, and then you're forced into a breakout, and the breakout usually means that you lose all your heavy equipment because the guys just go out at night through the woods because you, you can't get your survival your heavy equipment. So when people talk in, in Washington in these wonderful abstract tomes about, well, you know, is it escalatory for, uh, the, uh, for us to give uh, uh, anti-tank weapons uh, to the Ukrainians? Basically, they need what's called a tandem warhead, either Javelin or Tow 2, which has two warheads. So the first warhead explodes the reactive armor, and the second warhead burns through the tank. We have these sort of abstract discussions. But what's killing that army is their inability to stop mechanized forces um, and, and, or to react when, when there's a, a breakthrough or an outflanking. Um, one could say that the failure of the ceasefire, which I'll get to in a minute, of Minsk I, was a direct result of two decisions. One, by Putin to keep supplying and fueling the conflict. And secondly, done here in Washington, because we refuse to give the Ukrainians, ever since summer, uh, any of these anti-tank weapons. They don't want them as a gift, they want to buy them. And when we won't give them to them, no other allies who have them will give them to them without our permission. But this about done? Okay. Uh, quickly, uh, I, I mentioned artillery. Uh, there's lots of it. It's very lethal. The Russians are using lots amount of uh, MLRS with canister warheads. In the, in the 80s, we thought we had an advantage with these top attack munitions. Uh, typically, we said it was from four to 10 times more effective as high explosive. Then along came Princess Di and the concern about mines being left on third world battlefields. So you have the Princess Di Convention. By the way, we're getting rid of all of our, of our systems. We're going back to high explosive. But of course, the Chinese and the Russians haven't signed that. Uh, this is what it does. That entire battalion was destroyed in three minutes. Combination of top attack and thermobaric uh, high explosive. Uh, this is the ceasefire. Now, if you look at that chart, that's a daily plot of major combat. That's at least 100 artillery strikes to count as one event or 100 people involved. Uh, to be classed as an event. To call the, what happened, Minsk I, a ceasefire, is to defy all normal meaning of the English language. There are real problems with the ceasefire. The OSC was never designed to be a monitoring force like this. It was designed for people who were having, like a marriage counselor, not a referee in, a, in, a, in, a, in this kind of brawl. Uh, when the fighting starts, they leave. Uh, they just announced that, that they're, they're increasing their staff to 350 people. You couldn't monitor that, that ceasefire with 3,500. 3, they only monitor two of the border crossings. There's, I can identify 12 major border crossings where the equipment's flowing through. 
Uh, when I was at Mariupol, there were more Russians members, the Russians are members of the OSC teams, and there were more Russians in the team than there were West Europeans. And they're walking around and standing in a Ukrainian position with their cell phone typing in the coordinates. Um, this is not an organization to have any kind of meaningful monitoring. Uh, they went out and got four, uh, uh, four RPVs, and uh, the, the Russians have a very, very interesting electronic warfare device now that, that actually can project uh, electronic beams and uh, it's taken, taken them out. MINS-2 will fail if we try to have this system. MINS-2 is, is a, was, was, a ceasefire was needed for, the, for, for, for everybody concerned, the people, the Ukrainians, and so forth. God help us to, when we have politicians who don't know about military issues and they then invent the rules for a ceasefire. Because they said, oh, we're going to move the heavy equipment, the artillery and tanks, 50 to 70 kilometers on each side of, of the line. So what that means is the, 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 the line of separation is a bunch of strong points that can't hold anything except an infantry attack. So now if one side decides that they want to take military advantage of that, you can cross that 100 kilometers in a couple of hours. Now, the Ukrainians don't have any strategic intelligence. They don't have any monitoring, and the OSCE purposely has a week delay, a week-long delay in giving them information, and any intel they get from us in NATO has a delay, lag time. But we're talking about a lag time in hours. So if, if, if the separatists get a four-hour start, they will be through that infantry screen and into the rear, and then it's going to be one big uh, media engagement with a wide open front and no clear defenses. It is a game plan. It is, it is, you could not design a disaster better than, than, uh, than Merkel and Holland uh, gave us. Uh, I won't go into the deal. The Russians have uh, been playing uh, issues with nuclear weapons. Uh, I'm happy to talk about it uh, later. Um, some lessons. I've hit most of these. Uh, this about the, the political. We in the West really aren't set up for this. You know, we, we, our, our idea of special forces is Rambo, you know, eating snakes. And the, the, their idea of a special forces guy is a guy who, you know, wears factory stuff, uh, maybe carries a little Markov in his back pocket, but uh, meek, mild, probably wears glasses. He's an agent. He's an organizer. Uh, he's connected. He builds a, a cell, and then he, and he gives that cell to build other cells. That is the kind of warfare that goes on at the first just stage. Uh, I've hit most of the points in terms of, uh, of the battle issues. Uh, battlefield's not lin linear. I didn't go into a number of other issues that uh, face. Uh, one thing, uh, I was at, in Mariupol and the commander's standing next to me and he says, uh, hear that noise? I go, no. Uh, look up and about a thousand feet up is a drone. He said, we have 10 minutes to get undercover. Uh, 10 minutes, you know, so we, we walk away. And uh, it was probably 15 minutes. That entire position was, was destroyed in a fire strike. Uh, the Russians have broken the code on reconnaissance strike complex, at least at the tactical operational level. I have been with units that, that, that for, for the afternoon I was with them, they were overflowed no less than eight times by drones. This is the new robotic world out there. It is striking what's happening, uh, and, and, and not just in terms of Russia, but in terms of the whole nature of, of war. When you combine them with, with precision, accuracy, and then the uh, massive conventional lethality. Uh, I've hit basically most of the points. Let me just, my last, uh, uh, bear with me just for my last point. The victim of hybrid aggression is also victimized by Western caution and prevarication. While Russia has introduced thousands of weapons to the conflict, European and American political hesitation in helping Ukraine acquire replacements for its losses and the political message it sends to others who would like to help them serves as a virtual military embargo on the victim. Ironically, the most successful Western sanction has been against the people who we call our friends. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Phil, for that very highly illuminating and informative presentation, if also quite a disturbing presentation as well. Uh, but like I said when I invited you here, I think you've demonstrated that you've been able to say things that nobody else is really talking about in the media in general and things that I felt, and I'm sure you agree, needed wider uh, dissemination and wider discussion. Uh, now, given the, the limited time available, I'm going to forego the exercise in the usual moderator's prerogative of asking the first question and uh, open this up for discussion from the floor. Uh, if you want to speak, ask a question, please raise your hand and, if possible, uh, state your affiliation and uh, we'll try to get as many of them as possible. And since we're going to run a little bit over, I'm going to leave it open for, for a little bit longer than scheduled. Uh, if you need to leave, please feel free to do so. Yes, Andy. You remember the, the slide I showed where they're bringing all these elements from brigades all over, the, all over Russia? Yeah. People ought to study that. First of all, a third of their army is inside, in, in opposite the Chinese border, and, and it isn't going anywhere except for occasional battalions. Another third of it is essentially in, in the, from between the Urals and the Volga. So um, there's a reason that they were taking those pieces and moving those pieces in and not using real brigades. And I think the reason is that they don't want to put conscripts, uh, they don't want to put Russian drafted kids into that kind of maelstrom. Uh, could they bring those in? Yeah, and, and they, could, uh, they could double, so if there's 48 uh, battalion tactical groups right now, they could get up to 80. Uh, within a month of, of, uh, of, mobile, of, of, of redeployment. Over three months, they might get up to 120. Um, if the Ukrainians were just where they were at the beginning of this conflict, with the addition of anti-tank weapons, um, they could certainly hold uh, against uh, 80 battalion tactical groups. Uh, the problem is that every day the Ukrainians are getting weaker. If we had brought, if we had sent uh, Javelin, if we'd sent uh, 100 Javelin and Toe 2, I don't think you would have had the winter offensive if, if, if last fall. Uh, it, is, it, it is truly a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, so can the Russians escalate? Yeah, but, but at what cost to their own, what happens when people use that imagery, we think about, oh, it's the Russian army with 220 divisions, we're gonna take a roll, steamroll on anybody. Well, that, that is not the case. Um, I mean, it's amazing that the Ukrainians uh, did as well as they did in, in holding uh, this last offensive. Uh, and and uh, in battle after battle, uh, uh, as long as the Ukrainians don't get enveloped and, and, and caught in a pocket, they're inflicting three to four times as many casualties as they're receiving. And th that's documented. Uh, so <clears throat> is Russia big, bigger than Ukraine? Yeah. Is their army bigger than Ukraine's? Yeah. Um, can they bring that whole army to bear? No. Uh, is that army, does is, is, is all of that army look the same? No. Uh, it's interesting. You walk through the units that they've lost. They lost an entire regiment of the 76th uh, Airborne. Uh, they've lost two or three of their, uh, uh, the, virtually, I'm not, not talking about decimated, I'm talking about wiped out of their, of their best Spetsnaz brigades. So the cream of the Russian crop 
that has, 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 a lot of that has been, has been uh, the, their best trained guys have been, have been killed in, in very intense combat. Um, so I, I, I think that is a, a truism that's an excuse. Is the Russian deal bigger? Yeah. D does that mean that, that, that there's no hope for, for anybody? <laughs> they, they could roll over NATO too? I mean, no. It, it, it's, 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 uh, what, what can the defender do to, 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 to now? I, uh, unfortunately, the longer time goes on the, and, the, and the weaker the Ukrainian army gets, what they need is, is more. So last summer, a couple hundred javelin or tow too. If, if this thing, and just in the anticipation it may open up, having dismounted uh, anti-tank guided missile launchers is not enough now. You need, tow, you need the, the tow two on the, on a, on the M113. You need some kind of mobile platform to be able to, 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 to use it. Uh, last summer, I would have been content. I was content in front of the house uh, to say, you know, we had five items. Only one of them was was lethal, and that was anti tank weapons. The other was counter battery radar and, and surveillance drones and so forth. Now, you know, if 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 I was asked, I would say uh, we, you know, we got a couple thousand Bradleys sitting out that, with nobody to man them. Yeah. Um, I start sending Bradleys over because uh, they they need the the uh, the they need the armor and they need the uh, anti armor capability and the mobility. Um, they didn't need that four months ago uh, because they had enough of their own. So the longer it goes on, the the the, the tougher it is it's going to be to to uh, to help them. But I, I, there's a couple of shibboleths, and and one is this oh the massive one. The other one is escalation, and I, and that's the one I find. Um, I'm pretending you asked that question, but but it, that's the one I find most obscene. They bring in tanks, and then it's escalatory if we give the Ukrainians anti-tank weapons. They bring in a thousand tubes of artillery, but it's escalatory if we give the Ukrainians uh, long-range counter-battery radar. They have drones flying over the place like it, it, it's as busy as Kennedy Airport. And, and, and we can't give the Ukrainians some, some drones so they can see what's going on. By, I mean, it, 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 it is just an obscene argument. Anyway, I, 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 there's some more questions. I won't get too carried away. Thank you for, for, for asking my pretend question. Point well taken. Gentlemen in the back here with the camera, you come. Wait for the microphone, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for the presentation. It was great. Uh, speaking of, I'm John Caves at National Defense University. Yeah. Speaking of escalation, how significant do you think uh, the nuclear dimension is to Russia's willingness to engage in this kind of aggression? And if it is significant, should there be a nuclear dimension to the Western response? Yeah, I, I didn't. Could you repeat those, the, the last cap? The last. Right. If if the nuclear dimension is important to Russia's willingness to engage in this type of aggression, should the Western response include a nuclear dimension? Uh, uh, I'm going to cheat and go back a couple of slides, just because it's, I think it's easier to actually talk to the chart. This is actually from a Russian uh, article uh, in '99, where they talked about, and they, they came up with this theory called uh, uh, "escalate to de-escalate" or "nuclear de-escalation." I, I, I read it and I go, it, it turns on your head everything you, we, we thought we knew about strategic deterrence. You know? But to sort of draw the distinction, where Say, for example, un under NATO's forward defense, uh, uh, under NATO's flexible response, we would have a tactical escalation, well, almost quasi-symbolic, then some battlefield, then it might go deeper, it was called deliberate escalation, then you had general nuclear response, but it was staged up. Their argument is, no, you pick, you pick the, the, the point at which you think the opponent will be so impressed, will, will lose will, and that's the point that you either threaten or use. Now, maybe down here, if you're kind of against somebody who doesn't have any nukes and they're kind of weak will, you're going to go, you don't even have to have a demonstration. If you, you get on the phone and do what Putin did to Poroshenko and, and threaten him. I wasn't in the conversation, but I'm told that it was a direct nuclear threat by Putin to Poroshenko, which is sort of, sort of ironic given the, the, the Budapest <laughs> agreement. Not only do they violate the Budapest agreement, they're actually threatening uh, nuclear fire against the victim. Um, 
the Russians are building or are or, or, or deploying a, a wide range. We, uh, you know, Daddy Bush and um, Yeltsin uh, had the agreement at Vladivostok to get rid of, it was the, uh, one of the great non arms control agreements of all time. Uh, it was the mutual unilateral reduction of tactical nuclear weapons. So we got rid of about 10,000, kept 300 B-61 air-delivered bombs. They had around 20,000. They've come down to around 5,000. About half of that force is modernized. Uh, uh, smaller warheads, a sub, sub, uh, a sub kiloton, and they're putting them on a wide range of things. They're putting them on SAMs, they're putting them on artillery, they're putting them on torpedoes. Now, so they're serious about, I mean, they are at least having adopted the concept of uh, we don't have enough conventional forces to, to defend all of our territory, therefore we need a nuclear. They've certainly built that, that, that option. Um, if I was Chinese, I would say, yeah, you, would, well, you better respond uh, 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 with similar capability if you want to, uh, if you think you're going to fight those guys. For us, if we're planning on defending in Europe, then we need to rethink it. But having lived through the ER debate and the INF debate, uh, I'm sort of at the point, this is me personally, um, they don't want to be defended, it's okay with me. <laughs> um, uh, but if we have people and interests that we think are important enough that we and the Russians might actually get in conflict with each other, the side, there, there's two conditions that are, I think, inarguably true about tactical nuclear weapons. Because there's a huge debate. And most people think that, that, that they're not useful, but there's two conditions where they're decisive. One is when, we're, when one side has them and the other doesn't, okay? That's pretty clear. The other is when both sides have them, it tends to make such a mess of the battlefield, nobody moves around, uh, it just sort of, you turn, turn Blitzkrieg into Sitzkrieg. So if you think that we're going to be in a situation where we're going to confront them, uh, uh, they are decisive when they got them and we don't. And, and, I'll, and air, 300 air-delivered gravity bombs are not a nuclear capability, particularly when they come from a half dozen uh, airfields that can be preempted conventionally, let alone uh, with uh, nuclear strikes. That is not a serious tactical nuclear capability if you're talking about doing that. Uh, the, um, did, did, I, did I hit most of your points? Yeah, I, the thing I was just Yeah, I, I think anybody who who plays that game needs their head examined because they are they are are playing Russian roulette. Excuse the, the, the pun, but I mean, you, you are letting loose forces that are just um, uh, and you're doing it uh, in, in some of their exercises. They're, they're, uh, they they ran. I think it was part of Zapad, uh, 2009. They assumed we were reinforcing Europe, so in their play they assumed that, so they hit Norfolk with a with a cruise missile, uh, but that wasn't a strategic exchange. And you go, I mean, I don't know what universe these guys are living in, but it, uh, it, it are they articulating it? Have they built a force structure to try to to, to implement it? Yes. And when a push comes to show, are they crazy enough to do it? I hope not. <laughs> On that note, I'm afraid that's going to have to be the last question. Uh, Dr. Carber has another engagement after this. We need to make sure he gets there on time. So I really want to thank you, Dr. Carber, for just a fabulous presentation, very informative, and I know I learned a lot.
and I hope the rest of you guys that. did. Thank you and uh, thank you all of, to all of you for coming, and I look forward to hosting you again for the next edition of the Russian Military Forum. Thanks.